um, good good afternoon. I am I am uh, going to step in for Nicole. She fell sick today this morning. Um, to moderate at the same time, be part of the panelists of of this discussion. Um, perhaps a quick round of introduction from from everybody. My name is Ika Langele. I work in Turkana in Northern Kenya uh, with an organization called Friends of Lake Turkana. I will ask my fellow panelists to introduce themselves uh, just shortly. Hello everyone, my name is Fadzai Trakino. I'm the director for women and law in Southern Africa, uh, which is represented in seven countries uh, with uh, office presence in Mozambique, uh, Eswatini, Lesotho, Mos uh, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. And I am speaking from the Zimbabwean office. Thank you. Has Mela joined? Yes, I'd seen her in the chat, box, but I'm not sure if she's now included on the panelists. Yes, she's there. I can see Hello, on the chat. Let's just go on ahead and introduce yourself. It may take a minute before she moves. I have just changed um, settings. Uh, thank you very much, Ikal. Um, thank you, Fadzi. My name is Mela, and I'm an independent researcher. And I'm calling here from Harare, Zimbabwe. Thank you. Is there any other panelists, or is just the three of us? It's hard being a moderator and a panelist at the same time. <laughs> All right, um, comrades, colleagues um, on the call. Um, as we know, this is a festival fighting inequality. And um, as part of the African Women Development and, and Communication Network, FEMNET, whose work is really about strengthening the voice, role, and contribution of African women's rights organizations and individual activists in shaping policies and decisions that have impact on their lives and their work. And you know, it was very important, you know, as FEMNET is part of the contributors to this conversation, FEMNET is a member of the Stop Bleeding campaign. Uh, consortia, which consists of six Pan-African civil society organizations, all working towards uh, expanding the illicit financial flows discourse beyond limited technical expertise, working on natural resources, but really creating a space for African women um, to be part of the discourse, to be part of, of, of um, contributing to the um, solutions being produced, I, I, you know, whether at the African level, or at the global level. So in this particular one, we're going to just dump in, because again, we've run out of time, you know, given the significance of extractive sector in African countries, as well as the heightened impact of illicit financial flows within the sector, this session will seek to explore and understand the gender aspects of the extractive sector in Africa and their relationship with illicit financial flows. The agenda demands that principles of equity and respect for human rights, especially the rights of women and girls underpin the natural resource management. It honors the rights of nature and recognizes that women and communities may oppose resource extraction as we advance a just transition to a low carbon world. So in this session, it seeks to, we seek to explore the priority areas to advance feminist natural resource governance and to protect and promote the rights of women in the extractive industry. So I will ask um, Mela to start with, you know, just give us some, some um, you know, your thoughts around this and really um, pushing around, you know, how, how the intersection of women's different identities and roles may have on our experiences with natural resources, gendered impacts, you know, because you've been doing this work for quite a while, especially within the Southern, um, Southern African region, but again, you've expanded your work to DRC and East Africa. So if you could give us, um, some opening, some thoughts around this. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Ikal. And uh, indeed, the, the extractive sector um, in Africa, it is as, as old as um, I, I think from before even colonization, uh, there was the extraction, but the model of the extraction, it was, it was different. And uh, I think the way that we understand the extractives um, at the moment has largely been shaped by colonialism and the growth of capitalism. And also that has perfected even the exploitation of women within the extractives. 
And often when, when we um, conceptualize the extractives the way that it is usually uh, perceived, it is often seen as the extraction of minerals only. But when we look at, when we look at Africa, it is actually not only the extraction of mineral resources, but we have had uh, extraction of, of forests, uh, uh, for example, in the Diara Congo that Ikal uh, uh, is mentioning, we, we, we are all aware that in terms of um, geographical space, the Diara Congo is one of the largest um, in Africa uh, in terms of the, the, the space, and it has um, uh, some, of the, some of the biggest um, in terms of uh, forest resources. And so when we look at the Diara Congo, just placing the Diara Congo as um, a kind of unit of analysis, we um, uh, uh, see how the Diara Congo from the time of, uh, from the time of uh, 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 colonization, what the genocide that took place in the Cong Congo, it was all as a result of the extractives. And let me just say that, all this uh, extraction that would be going on, the demand of raw materials, that is actually uh, being shouldered on, on, on women. And why I'm saying that, because we have the extraction of, of women's labor, that is the extractive industry intensifies, so does the extraction of women's labor. Why? Because women take up roles within the extractives, some of them invisible, some of them visible, and along the whole value chain of the extractives industry, women participate in several roles, right? If we would just look at the mining that is going on in Tatanga, right? The, 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 the gold mines, the diamond mines, when we look at how are women um, are, are, are contributing or how are women impacted by what is going on. Women work as caregivers within the, within the pits uh, or the, the, the mines, whether they are industrial mines or they are, they are uh, small scale mines, but women perform particular roles uh, either as paid or unpaid work. But we all know that social reproductive roles are usually associated with women. So we look at women taking part in the mining itself, but they are largely invisible according to a lot of research across Africa. Women who are participating in the mining sector, particularly in the informalized sector where the majority of women are participate in, it is uh, largely invisible and it is largely work that they do uh, 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 and is underpaid, right? And even in the formal mining sector, the role that women play is underpaid, right? Their labor is, 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 is underpaid uh, uh, within, the, within the, the formal mining sector. And so we see also how the biggest extraction that is taking place within the extractive sector is the extraction of women's labor, the extraction of the, of the knowledge that women are holding. And when we talk about the extraction of the knowledge, when we look at the extraction of forests, for example, in the Diara Congo, you know, uh, forests are the, 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 the sources of, of life for a lot of women, including ourselves, including myself. They are life-giving. When we look at the extraction of water resources, and the, we, and the knowledge that women have of those uh, uh, natural resources, that is taken and appropriated together with um, uh, 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 the extraction of these resources. And why I say that, uh, um, I'm, 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 I'm part of also the academia, but one of the things that, you know, uh, the academia also contributes to the extraction of women's labor and knowledge is to, you know, when, when researches are done in the extractives about women, we do it using the same attitudes, you know, just extracting knowledge, packaging it, presenting it 
as knowledge that is coming from academia about, uh, about our resources, about our rivers, about our forests and all that. And so how do we make sure that this extractive industry works for women? How would we do that? There is need to redefine. And definitely there is need to rethink, particularly during this time of COVID, when you know a lot of African governments assume that you know, the economic salvation of Africa is going to come from, from extraction. So there is need to rethink. Uh, Ikal, I'll give back the time um, uh, to you. Thank you. Thanks, Mela. Fadza, can you join, um, give your thoughts on it? Uh, thank you. And let me just uh, put myself on video. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mela. And I will just pick up the conversation from uh, where Mela uh, left it. Uh, thank you for that contribution. It makes my, lot, my life a lot easier. And I just want to uh, bring in the conversation back to issues around uh, what she talked about, the value in terms of extraction. What we notice is that uh, in uh, Africa, in our dependence on uh, mineral extraction, there are a lot of multinational corporations uh, in the extractive uh, sector involved in mining oil and gas. And she rightfully put it that uh, the contribution has really been very exploitative. Uh, and we noticed that a lot of times resulting in conflict uh, and the brunt of those conflicts being um, the burden being disproportionately uh, impacting women. But also what we also need to look at is where the revenues are going. Uh, a lot of research that has been done um, has shown that uh, there is a lot of movement in terms of revenue through illicit financial flows from the multinational corporations that are carrying out mining activities uh, throughout Africa, through tax avoidance, tax evasion, amongst other illegalities. And hence, communities, especially women, have largely suffered from the impacts of um, extractivism without enjoying the benefits of the mining resources. Studies have shown the key connections between tax and gender justice that affect the fiscal revenue capacities of states and how this revenue is distributed throughout society. Tax policies are not neutral and they can hinder or promote social equity and gender equality, which is why whenever we talk about extractivism, we also want to look at the tax models and how they are able or not able to benefit communities. Women and men experience the impacts of tax policies differently because of their diverse and equal and equal positions, whether it is in the workforce, as consumers, as producers, as asset owners, and those responsible for the activities of the care economy in the household and um, also outside. And one of the things that we've observed in the extractive industry is that a lot of women are actually operating at the periphery of the mining value chain. So when you look at the mining value chain from the time of exploration, mining, mineral processing, smelting and refining, semi-fabrication, the final product um, within that value chain, a lot of women are at the periphery of uh, those enterprises. In fact, statistics across Africa actually show that only 8% of women are operating in the extractive uh, system. And this includes the artisanal miners and also part of the workforce. So this is really, really low in terms of participation and representation because the sector is very well male dominated. So one of the issues we have always wanted to highlight is the fact that through the uh, multi uh, multinational corporations operating across Africa in the extractive industries, there's a lot of illicit financial flows happening. And we need to find measures to curbing illicit financial flows. And this requires a multidimensional approach in terms of prevention, in terms of detection, in terms of punishment to be legislatively framed and socially sanctioned, because this is how we are losing a lot of the revenue that could actually benefit women in terms of social Father, services. Sorry, sorry, could, Father, 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 sorry. So could you do it slowly? The interpreter is struggling to pick up the pace. Could you speak slowly? Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. So I was saying we need to curb 
illicit financial flows through a multidimensional approach. And this requires that we look at prevention mechanisms. We look at detecting how these illicit financial flows are happening. We also need to look at punishment. Are there measures in place to actually punish companies that are participating in illicit financial flows? We also need to look at social sanctions that can be put against that. The major problem for most of the reports that we have reviewed around illicit financial flows in the extractive industry is the problem of impunity. In the problem of impunity is not so much one of impossibility, but rather the high improbability of bringing the perpetrators to account. So it has been very difficult for countries to bring the perpetrators account because illicit financial flows do not happen only at country level, but across multi countries. So it is difficult to detect, it is difficult to bring the perpetrators to account. The OECD report in 2014 also um, observed that authorities did not proactively investigate to seek the cooperation of foreign authorities in any going investigation. So for you to be able to detect, there also needs to be multi-national uh, um, cooperation across countries to be able to do that. But what also makes it impossible is that a lot of the multinational corporations are registered in tax havens. So this is also the other problem that our African countries are, uh, are also affected in terms of detecting uh, illicit financial flows. The other issue that we notice is that a lot of our African governments are still bound by double tax agreements from the colonial era. So Mela already mentioned that extractivism started way long back uh, and the colonial model also brought in its own dimension. And part of it was the double tax agreements. So the problematic part of the double tax agreements is that they're talking about um, avoiding double taxing of a company. And in most cases, the taxation happens at the host country. So if, for instance, minerals are being mined in DRC, the company that is mining will not pay taxes in DRC, but will go and pay taxes, say, for instance, in France, which is the host country government. By doing so, it means that the host or the source country of the mineral has already lost a lot of revenue. So these double tax agreements are still also depleting the revenue base that could benefit women for mineral resources. The other issue that we also need to highlight are issues to do with the human rights-based approach. The UN brought in UN guiding principles on business and human rights around 2011. A lot of our African countries are yet to even come up with national plans of action on the implementation of business and human rights. By business and human rights, we are simply saying that states, businesses, investors, trade unions, civil society, and all stakeholders are supposed to be bound by principles of human rights in whatever enterprise that they are carrying out. It is also the state duty to protect the human rights of its citizens against corporations that are investing in their countries. But we also see that a lot of the legislation in our countries is very weak in terms of protecting citizens. Citizens are really left at the mercy and the help of civil society organizations to fight for their rights when large extractive industries come to grab land from them without due diligence having been done. They also fall short in terms of access to remedies when their rights are not protected. It has also taken a lot in terms of civil society support for litigation to happen. And we want, we want to commend civil society organizations that have taken it upon themselves to demand accountability in terms of fair tax policies, in terms of compensating communities, especially women that have really lost out from the uh, extractivism model. 
Just today, I was excited to hear the news of the Ogoni case in Nigeria, where um, the court has now ruled out that they need to be compensated several millions of dollars from the destruction that happened with the oil extraction uh, in the Ogoni um, case study in, uh, in Nigeria. So I will end it there in terms of some of the remedies and suggestions that could be done. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Fadza. Both you and uh, Dr. Mella mentioned the idea of loss of land. Uh, and so just in, in opening our thinking, the focus on um, illicit financial flows, the equity and inequities around um, mining happening, because mining does not happen in a vacuum. So everyone focuses, the, I mean, the discussion on IFF has been in terms of tax related issues. But then the question I'd like to find, ask both of you to just unpack for us, what about the, what we would say skewed valuation of land and resources? Because when you talk about extractives, be it minerals, be it oil, it is happening on land or on water that was, you know, a base of production for people uh, and especially women, uh, land that was, you know, a place of production and the aspect of the water that is used. So how do we bring the other resources that are found on our lands and territories into this discussion of illicit financial flows? Because it is the valuation system um, open for any of you can, can start on it. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Ikal, um, for bringing one of the most important and, and uh, life-giving uh, uh, resource um, or resources in the form of land and in the form of um, our rivers. And when we are talking about illicit financial flows, for sure, like what you mentioned, Ikal, that we are not talking about the uh, taking over of the land and the undervaluation of the land. Because usually when extraction is going to take place, the land is either given for free or it is undervalued. And the undervaluation of the land is part of the illicit nature of the extractives. And it is part of how you know capital is flying out. And I wouldn't like to reduce this issue of land to financialize it, uh, either land or water, because I do not think that we can be able to put um, a, a, a price tag on land because lives depend on the land and the water bodies and everything, we can't really put a price tag, but it is the most essential. And this land, if we look at how, you know, the extraction of land just goes on, it's, it's you know, um, when governments are negotiating for, for with, the, with mining companies or with industrial miners or with the, the conservancies uh, that, are, that are going to be doing, uh, uh, to be engaged in the tourism sector, the land is not, is not taken into consideration they only value the minerals. And when we talk about the, the, the misappropriation of the, 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 the value flying out of Africa, we often do not look at land. We often do not look at the rivers. And just like what I mentioned, the work that women were doing on the land, because it is often considered as non-productive. I don't understand how this uh, mainstream economics work, but for me, what they consider unproductive is actually the most productive because women are producing uh, food on the land. They are sustaining lives. Millions in Africa have lost their land, their lives, and they are largely women who are involved in this whole value chain as food producers, as, as, as um, uh, fishmongers and all that. And when that happens, the labor of women, the land, the forest, the rivers, all that they are worth flies out of Africa. And who is the main beneficiary is not someone who is in Africa. No, 
it is someone who is benefiting from getting uh, uh, undervalued, I mean, undervalued resources from Africa and getting the most out of that. I don't know if uh, uh, Fazi, you, you would like to add something uh, uh, equal with your indulgence, but I, I think land and how, you know, the, the, the worth of land just flies out, out of um, uh, Africa is, is, is just the biggest injustice that is going on and that has been going on since time immemorial. Thank you. Well, Melaya, very right. Uh, and uh, of our observations uh, is that uh, a lot of um, the land, uh, especially in communal areas, uh, which become extracted uh, is state-owned land. So in the first instance, again, going back to the colonial regimes, this land originally belonged to the indigenous communities, but was expropriated and through um, legal statutes was given to the state. So invariably, the communities don't even own the land. Uh, and in most cases, this is how in the end, the state will simply gazette this land um, and give it to a foreign entity for no value at all, uh, despite the fact that it is occupied by indigenous communities because legally it belongs to the state and not to the communities. So the state chooses how and to whom it disposes uh, the land to and uh, including the value is also determined by the state. So this is where our argument has always been that the states need to take a business and human rights approach where they recognize the rights of the indigenous communities, where they recognize the rights of the women that have been utilizing this land, this, this land as a source of livelihood um, amongst other things, and then allow the communities to make a choice on whether or not this land should be given away for whatever purpose, whether it's for an energy project, for a tourism project, um, or for the purposes of mining. We also notice that some governments are coming up with the revenue sharing mechanisms that involve communities themselves to make a decision on how best they can put value to the natural resources um, that are within their localities and make a determination in terms of how they can fairly and equitably benefit without the state itself negotiating on behalf of communities. But we find that there is very little uh, progress in most areas where these revenue sharing mechanisms are also being implemented. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Milan Padza. Um, I, as, as I was mentioning, the looking through the concept, the conversation of low carbon um, economy and, and Mela, you and I have been um, in various conversations around the right to say no. But when when you look at it, uh, even in, as we go into the renewable energy, just, you know, the push for renewable energy and the, and, and the transition to renewable energies, you realize that the African continent is the source of all the minerals, the bauxite, the, the aluminum that is needed, the cobalt that is needed for the renewable energy. So how do we bring in, how do we make sure that this transition is not as extractivist? Because even as we walk away from the, you know, the fossil fuel that we've seen what damage it's done and get into um, a renewable energy, we see that the resources, the minerals are going to come from our continent. So how do we make sure that women are the center of this and we make sure that this is going to be a just transition? Any of you can pick up from this. Uh, thank you very much. I, I will, I will uh, start Fazi if you don't mind. Um, you know, I, I, I see this uh, whole idea of, of um, transitioning uh, to, to a low carbon, uh, I mean carbon economy, as something that as feminists and as women in Africa, um, we shouldn't allow it to be captured so that it is corporate driven and so that it is uh, going to be um, uh, constructed around the same attitudes, right? 
the same attitudes of extraction, the same attitude of centering um, uh, uh, profit over people, right? And how we are going to do that, that is the most critical part. Because when we are talking, I've often said, when we talk about, you know, we need feminist economies, we need to be developing um, uh, feminist uh, uh, alternatives and, and all that. I often ask myself, which is the alternative for Africa? Because all this of uh, uh, the growth orientation, I, I'm not going to romanticize what you had in Africa, no, not in any way, but what uh, the kind of uh, uh, development model that we had in Africa, I, I mean, uh, uh, or learning, having some learnings from that, taking some progressive parts of it, it, it was not in this form that we know it, and Tata Fadwa Muropa is mentioning about, about patriarchy, how it was, we, we had patriarchy, we had our own patriarchy in, 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 in its uh, uh, own form. But then when the energy system, the renewable energy system, as long as it is going to be uh, uh, profit-oriented, growth-oriented energy for production, then we are not going to be moving away from the extractives because we are going to have people's land also being taken away uh, uh, through uh, uh, the creation of mega uh, uh, hydros. Uh, talk, for example, the, the, the mega Inga 3, that way where women are pushing their bodies uh, uh, on the front line to push back on that mega Inga 3, which we, we all are hoping that, oh, it is going to light the whole of Africa. It is going to light the whole of Africa at the backs of women, right? Uh, uh, the majority uh, 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 of whom are women. And when we talk about even the solar farms, they taking land from people. They are constructed around the same attitudes. So are we transitioning or we are reproducing the same system that is marginalizing women, that is subjugating women through uh, 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 being centered on making sure that we want to grow the economies. I think low carbon economies should be supported by solidarity economies. They should be supported by ways that are not harmful to, 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 to the people that are not harmful to the environment because currently we are sitting on a, cri on, on a climate crisis, right? And I, I know that the climate crisis has been overtaken by the, by the COVID pandemic, though I, I usually don't see the, I, I don't see the separation how, you know, uh, a lot of our governments, they are, they are, they are like centering COVID-19 and um, uh, now, as, as if, you know, if COVID-19 is going to end, then, oh, everything is, 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 is good. It is back to normal. We have the climate crisis, which is one of the most critical right now. Africa is devastated. Look at the cyclones, look at the flooding, look at the locust in, 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 in East Africa, in Kenya particularly, look at the droughts in, in, the, Sahel, in the Sahel region, look at what is going on. All this is going to be uh, intensified if we are not going to rethink our energy systems, if we are not going to rethink about what development means, what uh, 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 our economies are supposed to look like. And I think um, uh, part of the discussion that we should be having when we are talking about low carbon uh, uh, economies, we should start to imagine about uh, energy sovereignty. How do we take control of our energy systems? How do we make sure that um, we do not uh, have to rely on the national grid? I know, you know, uh, the energy system is part of the drivers of the, of the extractive industry. A lot of the electricity that is produced is actually produced for the extractives, for the agriculture, for the mining sector. And when we move 
towards what we are imagining, uh, the just transition? How do we ensure that we are moving towards regenerative economies? Thank you. Thanks, Mela. Fatza. Uh, thank you, Mela. And uh, maybe just to also add there that uh, one of the studies that we did with uh, Mela, just looking at uh, smallholder farmers and uh, communities um, and uh, how they were adapting uh, to issues to do with climate change and renewable energy. What is also concerning there is the fact that um, whilst we are transitioning, we are also ignoring the fact that the technologies that are being used and adopted are not owned by the African countries. So yes, we are adopting new technologies, but we don't own the rights, we don't own the patents. So what it means is that whilst we are extracting resources to provide for energy, the new technologies, we, we don't own the rights. So it becomes also expensive, especially for local communities, for local women. Uh, because we don't have the intellectual property rights and the patents for that. Then um, it's also important to realize that we also need to bring in women into the conversation, like uh, Mela clearly spoke in terms of solutions. At the moment, um, it's really governments to government speaking to each other, multinational corporations bring in the solution, but the women are really out of the conversation. So as we are talking about renewable energy and uh, low carbon uh, economies, we also need to look at the indigenous knowledge that women have and how that can also be harnessed in terms of coming with a sustainable solution that is also low cost for women. Because currently part of the challenge is that it is also very extractive and very uh, expensive. Thank you. Thank you, Fadza and Mela. I'm looking to see any hands up or any questions. I can't seem to see any. Since I have no, there's no question, I'm going to ask both of you. Again, it went back to a, 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 a statement that both, both of you made in the beginning around women, labor, and the mining sector. How about the ASM sector? There's this narrative that the, uh, the ASM sector in Africa is driven by women. Um, how then can this be? Is, is this the solution for the stepping stone? Cooperatives, there's discussions around cooperatives, discussions, of, and, and I've, I spoke to a, 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 a master's student saying that even in Southern Africa with the cooperatives, the women in the cooperatives on, on artisan on small scale mines are are seemingly struggling they're not making ends meet while the men are making you know seeming making some money so how is it that um you know what 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 were your thoughts around this and how does the artisanal and small scale mining contribute to the discussion around um natural resource governance and the inequalities within it Yeah, maybe if I can uh, start, I think we did once have a conversation with uh, Mela on this. And uh, I think one of the things we've always said, I think we need to make, uh, to give women the decision to be able to participate or not to participate uh, in uh, artisanal mining. But increasingly, we still see a lot of researchers indicated women are participating on the periphery of um, the artisanal mining sector. The artisanal mining sector is no different from the way it looks um, with large corporates. It is still very male dominated. Uh, and in fact, in terms of the levels of violence, because a lot of times artisanal mining is not regulated. Uh, most of our countries have not regulated it. There's no legislative framework in terms of protection or registration. So it is like an illegal informal business uh, operation or trade that is happening. I've always described it as mafia business, uh, highly militarized, because you find that uh, a lot of the security sector actors also participate and try to benefit from uh, the illegal activities of artisanal mining. So there's always a vicious circle of violence and it's very unsafe uh, for women. Uh, the methods also of mining are very rudimentary, uh, cause a lot of harm to the environment they also use a lot of to toxic substances that also harm the bodies of women. 
So these are the major challenges that we still find uh, a lot of our country governments are still struggling around the formalization or non-formalization of the artisanal mining sector. Um, we also um, continue to encourage that for governments that really see value in terms of the uh, output from the artisanal mining sector, they need to put in place legislation to protect women. You cannot have the artisanal mining, for instance, in Zimbabwe, contributing more than 12% of the gold output and still have it considered as an informal sector. It really doesn't make sense because really we are punishing the women uh, within that sector because they are not protected by any law or legislative framework. So a lot of times they have their gold taken away, they have their mineral resources taken away or sold at very low prices because they lack protection of the law. So these are some of the challenges that we continuously see. Then we also have a lot of women that support artisanal mining, not as miners themselves, but supporting through other um, trades, either sex work, uh, provision of water, cooking for the male artisanal miners and providing other ways within the sector. This is where you see the largest group of women participating, not as actual miners themselves. So these are also some of the challenges. And uh, I really fear that the same model that was used when women were still doing chicken projects, sewing projects, it's the same model that they are bringing into the mining sector. Women are encouraged to participate as groups, as syndicates, and cooperatives like you have, you have mentioned, with very support also from government. And this is very problematic and very exploitative. Thank you. Thanks, Fazai. So there's a question here. Do the speakers have a view of the role of environmental groups, conservation groups, or natural resource governance, particularly in the extractives and trade-offs? It is by Mar Marioni Chung. Do the speakers, I think you've seen the question. Um, we have, we're have. we running much. out of time, so make, make it short because um, we've run out of okay. time. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm going to speak uh, as a feminist and as well as uh, an, an eco-feminist, an African eco-feminist for that. Uh, and I, I think that there is a huge role that can be played. And I think that environmental and, and, and uh, conservation groups, they are all founded on different politics and, and principles and all that. But I think the main focus uh, is looking at how we should push for solutions which are not uh, profit-driven solutions uh, to environmental protection, to climate change, that we should put for, we shouldn't be uh, pushing for the false solutions like the carbon trading, creation of carbon markets, because they are largely responsible for, 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 for the destruction of forests. And why I say that, it is because when we start uh, financializing or saying that, you know, you can destroy the environment as long as you can pay for it or as long as you can make good in another place, then it just becomes a cost of business. And then uh, 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 the destruction can keep on uh, existing. So with environmental and, and, uh, con uh, with, and, and conservation groups, they, they have different politics and some of the politics is actually problematic. And I, 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 I really uh, would have loved to go on and add on to what Fazia said, but because of time, and I can see that um, uh, equal, there is a, a hand up. So I'm just going to end it here, but I think they should be having the right politics when it comes to uh, their advocacy strategies and positions. Thank you. Thanks, Mela. Um... Tafadzwa, you can, you can jump in. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Aiko and uh, Dr. Mela and Fadzi. The presentations were very enticing. I, I just wanted to make a brief comment with regards to the need to appreciate that uh, women human rights defenders who challenge power in the extractive industries need our solidarity support, not only in Africa, but also in Latin America and Asia. Um, th that narrative doesn't really come out well in the mainstream women's rights uh, spaces. There is need to stand in solidarity with the women 
who day to day defend their right to land, their right to own their natural resources, who are usually um, are vulnerable to the military power, state security power, and even the politicians as well. So I just wanted also to highlight the, the need to start speaking to each other within the feminist spaces and not work in silos. Uh, thank you, Aika. Over to you. I, I could not end it on a better note than that. Um, thank you, colleagues, comrades, everybody who participated in this. And thank you, Feminet, for putting this together because we've got to start these conversations as, as uncomfortable as they may be. We've got to start being comfortable in uncomfortable spaces. Thank you again uh, for a lovely session. Enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you. Bye.